Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the, the CFA VBA webinar on price and debt, reaching academic evidence and investment opportunities. Uh, my name is Hans de Ruiter, and I'm the CIO of Pension Fund uh, TNO, and I will uh, be the chairman for this webinar. Before we uh, kick off, I'd like to thank a couple of persons uh, for now. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Annemarie Munnink, the executive director of the CFA VBA, for making this webinar possible. And of course, I'd like to thank our speakers for today. We have uh, three excellent speakers. Uh, to start with uh, Pascal Bonny. He will discuss the academic evidence on private debt and uh, Pascal is professor of uh, practice in finance and private debt at uh, Tilburg University, where he's also the managing director of the Tilburg Institute for Private Debt. Next to that, Pascal is the CEO of uh, Romaco, a Swiss advisory and securities firm. Uh, next to Pascal, we have two speakers from uh, Schreuders, uh, Jerome Nehru and Natalie Howard. Uh, Jerome is the head of infrastructure debt and he will discuss the opportunities in the infrastructure debt market. And uh, Natalie is the head of real estate debt at Schreuders and she will discuss the opportunities in the real estate debt market. So today we have both the academic side and more the practice side. After the presentations, uh, so we start with the presentations and there at the end we will have a Q&A session and I would like to ask everyone to ask all your questions through the chat function that you find uh, below on your screen and when you ask a question please indicate to which speaker you would like to address the question. Anna-Marie will keep track of the questions in the chat box and she will make sure that we will discuss as many questions we can at the end. We are in, uh, with a big group. Um, in case there's no time to answer all questions, uh, we will do our best uh, to answer all questions that are not answered during the Q&A and then send them back to you. Uh, we will discuss that also with uh, the speakers for today and I hope they are willing to help us with that. Uh, so don't hold back on any questions you may have today. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and tomorrow we will send a link to all participants to access the recordings of the webinar and then you also will receive the presentations. The first presentation today is by uh, Pascal. Uh, I met Pascal, uh, I think, somewhere at the beginning of this year. And then I found out that apparently there was an academic institute that performed research on private debt and it was located in the Netherlands. So I was very surprised. It was in Tilburg. Uh, at Pension Fund TNO, we started investing in private debt. I think it was about three years ago. We made uh, two investments in direct lending, which we funded out of our investments in high yield. And uh, we felt that direct lending has better risk return characteristics than high yield. Um, and when writing the investment case for direct lending, I noticed that there was hardly any academic research available. And even on private debt in general, there was also not much academic research. Uh, which is in sharp contrast to uh, private equity, for which there's a lot of empirical research. So against that backdrop, I was uh, positively surprised that we have an academic research institute in the Netherlands, fully dedicated to academic research on private debt. And I'm quite sure there's a great need for that. So Pascal, may I ask you to take over the screen and share with us your views on private debt from an academic perspective. Yes, Hans, uh, thank you very much uh, to invite me to this CFA VBA uh, seminar or webinar. It's an, it's an honor and a pleasure to talk to your esteemed members. It's, it's true that uh, in sharp contrast to private equity, there is not much about uh, private debt research. So we hope to fill this gap. And as I have uh, received the time slot of 30 minutes, I will try to be uh, very precise and fast with my introductory um, slides. Let me see whether I'm able to change that. Yes, exactly. So we are going into four or five minute slots, basically. I want to warm you up a little bit for the private debt topics and uh, kind of give an introduction. As you might have observed on the, on the listed uh, private debt asset managers uh, since the COVID-19 um, losses and the market sell-off, they have basically tripled their market capitalization. So if there is anything like uh, market information and share prices, I would say there is something going on in the private market space. 
We want to turn then uh, on the second topic, which is the, the return to private debt funds. There is some empirical evidence on IRRs, uh, multiples and public market equivalents, especially I want to shed light on whether or not the private debt funds uh, outperform the market, and if so, which markets they do outperform. Then I want to give you some other risk and return um, information on the private debt asset class as a whole and uh, lay out some research topics of our institute. In total, that should not be more than 30 minutes. So I will be very fast. If you have questions, please note them as uh, Hans said in, in the chat and we can come back to those questions. As Hans also said, I'm working for Remaco, which is a buy side advisory firm on illiquid assets and an advisory firm in various other topics but now focusing on the asset management side um, on the buy side advisory to institutional investors we are a member of nextia nextia is represented globally with 34,000 uh, employees so we do have a global reach but most important for today is tilburg university's activity and research in the private debt space um, for those of, of you which is unlikely that do not uh, have uh, information on the Tilburg University rankings, I, I listed them in the presentation. So I think we can say that Tilburg is a, a quite accepted uh, academic institution, if not much more than that. You have read, or I hope you have read, in the Financial Times over the last 24 months, uh, many articles on private debt. What you might have seen in these articles it, uh, is two things. First, there is a big debate around private debt lenders or non-bank lenders as against the bank lenders and what they do and why they do it, whether the shadow banking system, as they call it in, in the media, is a good thing to have or a bad thing to have and what the risks uh, pertinent to it are. And it continues with like a debate about private versus public markets this is, according to Financial Times, the battle to watch, which I agree very much with this title. It is a big battle to watch, and it looks like it is uh, also a very interesting battle to watch. What we have seen in the last two to three months it, is that there are really large funds uh, coming to the market. So Aris, as one of them, has just raised 11 billion euros into one, into their latest European-focused fund. So it's not the case that private debt funds are small entities or small structures. I'd rather say that private debt funds, at least the leading funds, are quite big. The private capital industry as a whole has soared to beyond 7 trillion in assets under management. There is an interesting article on just that uh, fact in the Financial Times dated June 11, and I uh, would like to motivate you to read that article. It tells you a little bit about the uh, um, uh, institutional background, why private capital might have soared to above 7 trillion over the last few years. So let's jump into this warm up asset under management breakdown. Here you can see that private equity, which is the, uh, uh, um, the blue bars, has relative to the other asset classes somehow lost market share. The top line here is 100% of all alternative assets in closed end funds. And you can see that private equity goes down from something like 80%, I would say, uh, to below 70%. Why is that? Well, there are other asset classes taking some of that market. And we are going to be talking today about three of those, let's say, winners in the alternative space. One is real estate. I will leave all the knowledge and topics to our real estate experts and not talk about real estate today. The other is infrastructure, same for that. And I will be focused on talking about private debts or anything else, everything else about real estate and infrastructure. I will be talking on private debt strategies. If we look at this market, we have those four um, asset classes. I'm excluding from this picture the private equity asset class, as this is clearly the largest. Uh, you will have the numbers in my presentation, which I think CFA is sending to you. So you can see that real estate, uh, something like 1.2, infrastructure 0.8, private debt 1.1 or 1.05, uh, trillion assets under management are somehow co-developing in this space. There is one category, which is, or one asset class, which is natural resources, which is leveling off a little bit. But you can see that 
these through asset classes, and, and I think it's a, it's a perfect choice of the CFA VBA association that we talk about these three asset classes are really picking off. They're picking off um, somehow after uh, the global financial crisis, and ever since then they have been growing quite aggressively. These are the main private debt fund strategies. Yeah, you will find mezzanine, direct lending, distressed debt, and special situations funds in the market. Then some more specialized subcategories uh, like blended direct lending, unit tranche direct lending, junior or subordinated debt, etc. But I would say you could focus on mezzanine, direct lending, distressed debt, and special situations, which have these market shares, uh, they also give you those numbers which you will have in the presentation to have more detailed numbers. What is noteworthy is that within the last 10 years, from 2010 to 2020, uh, as sponsored transactions are concerned, the private debt firm or the private debt capital industries in general have taken over or at least come to an equivalent role uh, with banks. So here you see a chart that shows you all the sponsored private equity transactions that involved debt. And you will see that today it is somehow a 50-50 game in the market, whereas 10 years ago, this was a 50, a 25% market share on the private debt fund side and the 75% market share on the bank side. So you could see as a general picture and introduction that private debt funds have taken some market share in the sponsored transaction, which is primarily m and transactions market within Europe. But if we compare the growth indexed to 2007, which is roughly uh, the financial crisis, if we compare this growth of markets, um, even if they're on an absolute level much smaller, you can see that these markets have really outgrown the public markets. You can see in the blue line, um, that's the market cap of the multiverse total return index. So that's a double B bond index and also its capitalization. And you can see the FTSE overall index market cap. So the green light would be all private debt assets. And you can see that they outpace those markets although the stock markets have had a very good um, um, phase in the market behind them. So you could say that, and it's really true, that private debt markets grow much faster. They have somehow quadrupled their assets under management in the last few years, so much more than the equity and the bond markets down here. If you look at BlackRock um, asset return expectations, you can also see that BlackRock estimates the direct lending industry to return something like 9.3% on average. Very interesting. You also see the upper and lower bound as an interquartile range with 5 to 14% in returns. So an extremely attractive return profile from an independent um, at least independent from what I'm saying afterwards, Institute BlackRock, uh, which is quite knowledgeable, I would say, in the private markets. You see that only private equity has a 10-year estimation, which uh, should return more to investors. You can also see that direct lending as an investment strategy should return much better returns than a 60-40 portfolio. That will come back to those numbers and put our own research into the context of the BlackRock numbers um, at the end of my presentation. Here is the current versus the target allocation of institutional investors of private debt in general in terms of their own assets on the management. So if you look at pension funds, they would have something like 2% private debt allocation in their portfolios as of today and expect to go up to 5%. Sovereign wealth funds, Roughly the same picture. Wealth managers, same picture. Family offices, endowment plans, foundations. So in the cross section, I would say the private debt relative asset allocation is expected to increase against traditional asset classes. Introduction to the GPs. Have a look at, at the size. This is capital raised in the last 10 years. So Oak Tree has raised 50 billion, GSO 
43 billion Goldman Sachs Group just for the private debt strategies, 34 billion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can see these large GPs just in terms of a size ranking. Uh, are really large, so they would be raising something between 15 and 50 billion. And also the market concentration, which is a picture that we also see in private equity, is quite large. So the top 20 GPs have raised something like 40% of the whole market share. If we go into funds, I told you before that RS here is the uh, Capital Europe uh, 5, has raised something like 11 uh, billion. So one fund compartment or like one fund data structure, the larger funds start somewhere at five to 15 billion, which is quite large as well. Let's go to the largest investors in the world. You see many insurance groups, Manulife, Allianz, AXA. Um, you see pension and retirement systems. You also see kind of advisors, Stepstone and Partners Group, which have their own advisory activity and are active in manager selections, uh, public sector pension investment board, etc. They heavily allocate capital to the private debt fund industry. So the largest investors again would be between 10 and 30 billion. On the return, let me talk about a study that will be out to the market, out to the academic market in a few uh, weeks from now. Um, this study is done um, from Tilburg Institute for, for, for Private Debt together with Sophie Monigar from Flerick Business School and Ghent University. We look at basically two things. First, we wanted to provide a systematic examination of private debt fund uh, performance measured by several uh, performance proxies, which I will introduce later. Uh, and we wanted to ask the question, do these GPs have any skill to outperform the markets or time the markets? I will focus on the return of performance measures today. As the second part will need more time, but I can say something if there is time and room for questions at the end uh, of today's meeting. The paper shall be made available to the uh, webinar participants and sent out by um, uh, the CFA Association in maybe two or three weeks once it's out in the market. Short introduction to the sample. There are roughly 1,000 private debt funds uh, in the market uh, starting in 86 roughly on to, until 2020. And we have had a chance to look at the cash flow data. So we do have timed cash flow data for something like 450 private debt funds. We believe that this is uh, pretty representative of the overall uh, private debt fund market. It makes up for approximately 50% uh, of all funds. And if you if you went by size, it will make up uh, for certainly the larger funds in the market and represent a very large fraction of the industry. What you can see here is that the average fund size uh, goes to 1.3 billion. This is kind of very large. You can also see that it is still a very much US dollar based business. 85% of all funds are US dollar denominated. Only very few, like 12% are Euro denominated. And also in terms of geographic focus of those funds, 80% of that business is still US focused. Also interesting, these funds need something like three years on average to deploy the capital. So if you sign up and commit capital to a private debt fund on average and differing from strategies to strategies, you will have a three years capital deployment period experiencing uh, capital calls and capital allocation in the market. Uh, after like one and a half years on average, half of your capital can be expected to be deployed. We looked at these three multiples, uh, IRR, investment multiples, and the public market equivalent. As you all know, IRRs are somehow problematic to take as a performance measure, uh, especially in the private equity and the private debt fund industry. IRRs um, are typically upward biased as very early cash flows uh, affect the IRR um, ca um, calculation given the reinvestment assumption of a typical IRR formula. Uh, 
but we will show IRs, of course, to make those benchmarks. Then we take uh, the multiple. This is the cash and cash multiple, typically the total value to paid in multiple. It's often used, uh, but does not take into account any time value of money. It makes a difference if you have a multiple of two after two years or a multiple of two after 10 years. No need to explain that. So multiples are given, but still we believe there should be a better benchmark. Uh, we are using the Coplon and SOAR 2005 benchmark against three benchmarks. So we do benchmark a uh, investment grade bond index, a total return index. We do benchmark a high yield bond index, and we do also benchmark against the equity market using the S&P 500 index. A public market equivalent larger than one indicates an outperformance over the lifetime of the fund, whatever the lifetime will be. Uh, in percent. So exa for example, if you see a 1.2 public market equivalent, it indicates that this fund over the lifetime outperformed the market by 20%, just to explain the number. Let's go into the findings related to IRs. Here are our uh, 448 funds. We observe a 9.2 average return and the median return of 8.5% as measured uh, in IRRs uh, proxies. As you can see from the first to the 99th percentile, there is a large dispersion across those percentiles. So on the lower end, on average, you will only find a 5% return. On the higher end, taking the 75th percentile, you will find something like a 12% return. What is quite remarkable is that the top quartile delivers a 23% return as opposed to the bottom quartile, which delivers an IRR, which is slightly negative by 4%. The dispersion between the high to the low quartile is quite remarkable. It's a 27% dispersion. So I would say the IRR numbers as a whole speak for careful selection. I wouldn't recommend to go for a randomized uh, strategy and just pick whatever you get on the table. So selection is certainly a topic. Uh, you will always hear about the great average returns. So I agree, a 9% average return um, is a great return. Uh, just reconciling this with the uh, BlackRock numbers, they are expecting 9.3. So we find a 9.2% return. So this is pretty much in line. Uh, with other estimates. Let's look at the same picture in terms of multiples. We see a 1.3 multiple over the lifetime of a fund. The same picture, a large dispersion between the first and the 99th uh, percentage, percentile. Um, a large dispersion between top quartile and low quartile funds. And again, kind of the motivation to do a thorough due diligence and selection. Let's turn then to the question whether private debt funds on average do outperform the investment grade bond markets. Here is the result. Against the investment grade benchmark, which is the Bloomberg Barclays investment grade total return index, we find that private debt funds on average outperform this market by 8%. 8%, same picture from low to high, large dispersion. The best of them outperformed the market by some 38%. But here you can see, and this is a first important notice, I would say that if you take a benchmark, you can go to the third quartile and you have no advantage in terms of outperformance to the benchmark. Uh, if you go to the bottom quartile, you will be underperforming something like 18%. So you need to hit at least the two better quartiles or you need to go above median values to receive an outperformance or value for a non-liquid investment strategy. If we do the same exercise, use the public market equivalent against the high yield benchmark, you can see that even against the high yield benchmark, the average outperformance is 6%. The top quartile outperformance is 33%. The underperformance is somehow 19%. Same picture, you need to go to an above median fund universe to select those funds that outperform the market. And you will see that from the worst 
do the best on average, but also uh, in quartiles, it's a big difference to invest. Now, a little bit of a surprise, we thought then, but most probably given these uh, equity markets that we have seen in the last few years, private debt funds will not outperform the equity markets. Well, this assumption was wrong. We find an outperformance of 6% against the equity markets. A slightly comparable picture here at the two bottom quartiles. They underperform slightly, but if you, if you happen to select nicely from performing funds, you go to a, an outperformance of between 6 to 42%, which is really interesting, of course, to have in a portfolio. Generally speaking, we also test in this paper whether there is performance persistence. So if a GP has a positive and outperforming performance in the past, will the follow-on funds managed by the same GP also deliver outperformance? The, the answer is yes. And we were asking the questions, well, what delivers that outperformance? And that is something you can read in our paper. It's basically choosing the right economic conditions market conditions when a fund is launched. This is uh, even more important, has a, has a higher impact on future returns than um, the strategy, for example, or other elements which we typically control for, just a size, age, number of employees, etc. So let me give you some more insights about the risks. I've, I've talked about the return of the asset class. I have another five to 10 minutes to talk about risks and, 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 and topics and, and research. Here is two portfolios of private debt funds. So the first one is a very long sample. We looked at one GP, which managed to select those 280 investments over a period of 18 years. You can see here is the credit bubble or the global financial crisis, the green bars. And you can see that typically a good performing or a performing private debt fund will have most of the projects performing. That's the green and blue lines. And only very few of the projects delivering negative returns. You see a very big negative return here by minus 50%. Uh, but you only see a loss ratio or win loss ratio of or losses in the magnitude of 1.4%. So if you take all those investments and you ask the question, how many of those investments were negative and how many were positive? The response is, well, 280 were positive, only four were negative or some 1.4%. Here is another one, another fund that we believe is a performing fund. Uh, slightly higher loss ratio, but you also see that on, our, on average 112 projects positive against only four projects negative. So why am I showing this graph? I'm, I'm kind of indicating to any private debt fund investor that you should not only look at the return uh, on the black box level, like the funds, you should also look into funds and look at the profile and the return distributions and the volatility of returns. So this data are typically available if you look into the funds. Another question that, that we can answer today is, how market neutral are those funds? Somehow, uh, with the potential to disappoint you, these funds are not completely market neutral. You may, may have time lag effects in how the beta, for example, is measured. But if you look at the private debt fund industry, these are quarterly returns that we calculated at TIPD in Tilburg. So these are quarterly returns, the green line. The red line is the high yield bond index, or Barclays. And the black line is the investment grade uh, index. So if you take those benchmarks, you see that there is pretty high co-movement of those quarterly returns. You can see that there is some time lag, but this is given by reporting standards. But you also see, that's the good message then, that private debt funds corrected less in the financial crisis. I will show you the same picture just for the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, they recovered nicely, 
so the volatility is lower uh, but they are market related and they are not market neutral uh, in general uh, terms speaking there might be some that are market neutral i would say that those who, who uh, consciously choose a strategy that cannot be uh, market correlated but in the cross section and over those funds i would say um, if you want to assess market neutrality you really need to use quarterly returns recalculate them for a long time period to be sure that you have a market neutral investment in your portfolio here is another important risk dimension which is the modified value at risk modified for uh, the skewness of the quarterly returns and you can see that our benchmark groups equities on the right top here high yield bonds and investment grade bonds have a less attractive risk return profile if we take the modified value at risk as a risk measure we believe one should take modified value at risk rather than standard deviations which is more often seen in the stock markets as a risk measure um, and you can see that the debt funds cross section is somewhere here so quite quite a low modified value at risk somewhere at 2.4 percent meta land debt and direct lending even a little bit on the left of, of, of the cross section so two highly attractive uh, debt fund segments in terms of risk but even for special situations and venture debt those modified value at risk measures are really attractive if you compare them to for example investment grade bonds high yield bonds and equities i'm sure you will have questions here uh, and I'm, I'm happy to answer them later on here is another and the last exercise for today um, what is the probability that you fall short of a three percent return target if you take those quarterly returns so if i want to have a minimum three percent target what is the probability that in the end i will receive less than three percent using the same sample and cross section here are the probabilities you see that direct lending uh medicine and debt very low probability below five percent that they will have a return below uh, three percent you see that even venture debt distress that and special situations have a relatively moderate risk of underperforming for example the equity market investment grade bond market or the high yield bonds i think this is important as a long-term investor as you put money to an unliquid strategy uh, so over time what is my probabilities of falling below a certain target return and of course we can calculate that for any target return that's just a matter of um, uh, the formulation the last chart on the market returns and then i go to research questions this is the private debt fund industry's uh, quarterly returns throughout the COVID-19 pandemic or market crisis. You can see here the S&P 500. Now this of course are quarterly returns. So you see that here is the period where, where the markets already rebounds. So that's also why for the S&P 500 measured as quarterly returns, these losses are kind of lower. Um, we also use the high yield and the investment rate benchmark against it. And then we use Metaline debt, direct lending, the gray one, distressed debt, venture debt, and special situations. You see that only one strategy, which is venture debt, this one, still bears some losses on the books. You see that all other strategies kind of had less losses. Uh, losses that were lower than their benchmark indices and they, they recovered quite nicely together with the market right after the COVID-19 um, bounces back to a normal level. So I would say this reconfirms that private debt markets are not market neutral in the mathematical sense that it is somehow sometimes advertised. Research topics, uh, just eight points. The investor perspective, timing, portfolio optimization, short for risk, etc. This is very important research. If a pension fund or any other institutional investor, such as an insurance group, for example, wants to invest into private debt, 
um, how can I optimize my portfolio in a Markowitz or other optimization sense? If I take these returns, can I time the investment? Can I bridge finance my capital calls? What are my expected shortfall and value at risk measures? What is my shortfall risk? There is really not a lot of research. We are happy for anybody interested to collaborate with our institute to deliver either numbers or questions. Um, the private debt investment instrument uh, perspective, which is the fund level, which I've just now presented. But also we need more information about direct investments, syndicated investments, co-investments, etc. Then the portfolio level look. So what is really the portfolio level underlying risk that these portfolios are bearing? Is it a risk adjusted return that is interesting or not? Because now we have just benchmarked against some total return indices. We are not sure whether the risks that we find in the private debt portfolio is higher or lower than those uh, used in the index. Contract level research, almost nothing done so far. The capital receiver standpoint of view, so why do corporates lend from uh, private debt uh, lenders? The institutional perspective, is it that public markets really substitute banks? Um, is it that private markets substitute public markets and banks? And if so, to what extent and why? And then which market phases? The governance perspective, there is a lot of research saying that private equity has a different governance model. Is that also the case in private debt? And the SRI and ESG perspective, by the way, we are finishing a paper now on ESG, which compares uh, private debt, ESG to public markets, and also what drives ESG transparency in the sector. This was my contribution. I think taking into account Hans's introduction, I'm exactly at 30 minutes. If you have questions, uh, you can uh, certainly get this presentation by the CFA Association, but you can also mail me. The mail address is on the presentation. Also, there is the Institute's uh, homepage indicated. And as I said, I hope you will receive our paper on return and GP skill uh, in something like two weeks from now. Having said this, I am curious to hear your questions at the end of the webinar and I will end my presentation for the time being. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Pascal. Very interesting presentation. Uh, yes, please don't uh, don't hold back on your questions. Uh, you can just put them in the chat box. Uh, Anna-Marie will uh, ask those questions at the end on your behalf, so you don't have to, have to ask those questions yourself. So don't be shy. Um, well, as we have seen in the presentation of uh, Pascal, uh, there, there's still a lot of research that we need to do that can be done. I was out of curiosity. Uh, I was curious, uh, Pascal, we also do research uh, with regards to fund selection because that's also uh, well, an issue that's uh, quite important for a lot of investors, including myself. For example, when you look at private equity, there's a lot of research focusing on uh, things like uh, is there persistence in returns and uh, the size of the fund tell you, tells you something about performance and these kind of things. Is that also part of your research agenda? Yes, this is uh, an important part of our research agenda. So we have looked at the GP skills. So what, what skills must the GP have to outperform the market? Um, so our paper that's now coming out is on market timing skill. Uh, so it's, it's, it's linked to to the credit market conditions. We know that ex ante, so before launch of a fund, some credit market conditions are indicative of future returns of debt funds. But even more so, ex post credit market condition changes, and those changes measured over the capital allocation time of a fund, which we have seen is two to three years on average, for some of them even longer, um, they matter even more than the ex ante market conditions. So this is one outcome. Um, other outcomes are more related to typical controls, as you have said, um, size and other controls. And this will also partially be covered by the paper. But as you also said, there needs to be much more research on, on how to select a performing fund. And, and we are more than happy to collaborate with any uh, institution that wants to know more about this. Very good. Good to know. Hey, thanks again. Um, well, now we move from the academic side to the investment opportunities. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, we have two excellent speakers to uh, inform us 
on the investment opportunities in this market. We have uh, Natalie and Jerome from uh, Schroeders. And I think if I'm correct, uh, Natalie will start off with uh, the presentation on real estate debt. Is that correct? Because in that case, yes, that then is I correct. will move over to Natalie. I would say, say take over the screen. The floor is yours. There we go. Um, right, thank you very much, uh, everybody. My name is Natalie Howard, and I'm head of real estate debt at Schroeder's uh, Capital. Um, I'm speaking, uh, obviously, a little bit about my own product, and then I'm also joined by my esteemed colleague, uh, Jerome Neroud, uh, who is head of our infrastructure uh, debt investments. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying a little bit about uh, Schroeder's Capital, for those of you uh, who don't know uh, Schroeder's. Um, Schroeder's Capital is a part of Schroeder's, uh, where we are looking to substantially expand this particular division uh, within Schroeder's. Um, we currently have uh, $70 billion uh, of assets under management, um, with the majority of that being in US securitized credit and private equity and real estate. And then coming behind that, we have our infrastructure business, our insurance linked business and our impact business. Um, and each one of those products are specifically focused within particular areas uh, of those various uh, private markets. Um, we have over 250 uh, investment professionals uh, and in fact, nearly 500 employees uh, globally. Uh, and we are very focused on uh, providing and continuing to provide a consistent track record uh, to our investors uh, with a transparent integration of ESG sustainability and impact uh, capabilities. Um, I'm now going to talk about the thing I know the most about uh, out of all of those things. Uh, so real estate debt is a new asset class uh, for Schroeder's Capital, although I and my team uh, have been involved in this market uh, for anything from 15 uh, to 30 years at a variety of in institutions. Um, Schroders um, have set up and recently launched uh, real estate debt funds uh, across Europe. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about the context of uh, the real estate debt market and what that can offer in terms of relative value uh, for uh, insurance companies and potentially other types of, of investors. Um, so here, just really setting the scene uh, in the market, uh, we have uh, just over a trillion euros uh, within the real estate debt market uh, in Europe uh, and the UK. Um, on top of that, which gives uh, roughly about 250 billion uh, per annum of financing requirement because the majority of these loans are variable rate loans on a five year term. Um, what we've seen uh, over the last 10 years, uh, particularly initially within the UK market, is an almost complete retrenchment uh, of the banks uh, from real estate lending. Um, they have reduced their credit appetite, uh, moved out of uh, stretch senior and whole loans and mezzanine lending, and have retreated really just to investment grade lending. Um, some banks have pulled back further and are focused only on existing clients and are not looking to service new clients and have also reduced their sector appetite across uh, the real estate piece. Natalie, okay. may I yeah. ask you a quick, uh, is it yes. possible for you to put it on the slideshow so that you can make it bigger? It's um, not okay, I will. Um, here we go, hidden in the corner. No, that didn't work. Um, no, I can't, uh, hold on, maybe this might do it, slideshow. Is that better? Okay. Um, so, uh, this retrenchment of the lenders has uh, created uh, a substantial funding gap within the market. And what we saw in the UK uh, in 2010 uh, was we saw quite a sharp retrenchment. And over the last 10 years, that market is now 
roughly about 20% alternative lenders. And if you look at that in comparison to the US market where alternative lenders are about 40% of the market, and then you look at Europe where alternative lending is about 6% of the market, you can very clearly see the direction of travel uh, of a bigger proliferation of alternative lenders moving into that uh, gap that has been created. Uh, a little bit in the same way as we've seen in other uh, private debt sectors. Um, in terms of the opportunity and, and relative value, um, there are a couple of aspects of real estate debt that I think are interesting. One, it is a, a very uh, easily accessible um, marketplace or investment uh, via a variety of specialist teams that you have in a series of different uh, asset managers. Um, the market is, is illiquid in uh, Europe, but it does de deliver an illiquidity premium uh, to uh, investors, depending on where their risk appetite uh, might be. Um, here in the chart on the right hand side, uh, what we've tried to show is we've tried to show uh, the variety of real estate debt and the risk return that is available depending on uh, what the risk appetite is. Um, and first of all, in the navy blue, we have the investment grade senior debt. Um, and here um, we are targeting returns of between uh, 150 and 200 basis points uh, in Europe. And this is delivering an illiquidity premium over investment grade corporates, as well as diversification um, into secured uh, lending. And then moving uh, up the risk curve, uh, we have stretch senior loans, which are essentially loans that are secured on, again, uh, good or good quality uh, core and core plus assets, uh, but with a little higher leverage than you would get on an investment grade loan. And the banks really only play now in this investment grade area of the market. The remainder is exclusively alternative lenders. Um, and then we have uh, pre-let and partially pre-let development funding. And again, uh, slightly higher returns because uh, there is uh, two factors is one is obviously being paid for slightly additional risk, but also there are far fewer lenders that are prepared to look at development funding, even with a, a pre-let. And then we move into opportunistic whole loans, uh, where we are looking at targeting circa 8% returns. And these are loans that are typically levered to around about 75% on uh, speculative uh, property, uh, perhaps a hotel that's never been opened and newly built uh, without a trading history, history uh, perhaps um, some sort of um, speculative development um, where we are moving into 9% returns. And then lastly, we have the mezzanine lending where you are imp improving the property uh, aspect of it. So junior loans secured on core and core plus stabilising income producing property, but where you are the second mortgage, so therefore you're taking more debt risk. So just to set a little bit of context uh, here uh, for real estate debt and where that potentially sits in comparison to, to other classes. Um, as uh, I'm sure people are aware, um, real estate debt works quite well from a Solvency 2 perspective because it is secured uh, debt. Um, and here we show how the returns uh, that you can get for the different credit qualities across the different real estate debt uh, buckets on the left hand side can deliver you anything from one to two percent all the way up to your unrated risk at eight to ten percent for high yield. And when we look at the comparison to the European bond market uh, and indeed the US market, both in high yield and also in investment grade, you can see there's a clear pickup uh, which covers the complexity and also the illiquidity. And then here, just talking a little bit about the market opportunity post COVID-19. Um, 
I think we have seen more retrenchment uh, of the, the banks, particularly within the German market, has been very noticeable with reduced lending uh, to real estate um, and less so in the French market. Um, and this has allowed a greater opportunity for alternative lenders to come and move into to this uh, area. And in fact, uh, over the last 12 months, we have seen a couple of uh, new entrants into the market who are big players within the private equity uh, debt market. Um, we've also seen um, a divergence in terms of sector performance, where we have the darlings of the, of, of the sectors, which are logistics, um, and then uh, to a lesser extent, offices. Uh, food retail is very high on people's lists um, of favoured sectors. But when we look at retail more broadly, particularly secondary shopping centres, um, people are less favoured. And in fact, banks uh, currently, a lot of them will not lend on any retail, irrespective of whether it's a good retail uh, or, or not. And the same goes for hotels, given everything that's gone on over the last um, two years. Um, so what this does is it then provides additional uh, additional area where the alternative debt providers are able to cherry pick opportunities where they can actually look to take a very small amount of risk and an outsized return for that risk. Because the fact of the matter is, is there are very few options for borrowers uh, to go to, to to lever their in their property investments. Um, we've also seen a huge acceleration in the focus uh, on ESG from regulators and, and, and governors, uh, governments, but also from borrowers directly. Um, and, and in fact, at Schroders, our real estate debt funds um, are Article 8 uh, accredited, which we've been able to do because they're newly set up and that, that's relatively uh, straightforward. Um, and then I think, you know, the central bank responses has further driven down bond yields. And so I think there's a real spread pickup for real estate debt and to offer that relative value. So I think the key characteristics of real estate debt, there's a consistent return profile uh, that is paid on the quarter, out of the quarterly interest payments uh, derived from the loans. Um, there is an ability within this to pick the risk reward that best suits uh, your investment strategies and your portfolios. Um, at the higher end, it is an alternative to real estate equity uh, coming a little bit down the, the risk curve into perhaps uh, high yield uh, opportunities. And I think lastly, it's a very attractive time to move into this market. Um, unlike the leveraged finance market, what we've seen in real estate debt is we've seen a consistent uh, covenant heavy um, loan structures because it is a lender driven market and we've seen the maintenance of yields and returns uh, due to the lack of competition in the marketplace. So I think the key takeaways, um, retrenchment of the lenders, I think that um, it's very much a lender market and we believe it will continue to be so. Uh, we think there are lots of opportunities uh, across the sectors, particularly uh, for firms like Schroders that have big real estate equity businesses that help support underwriting and, and views on specific local real estate. Um, and then finally, we believe that there is a pickup to comparable uh, public debt, depending on where you want to play. And to that note, I apologise, I have run a little bit over, um, but to uh, follow on, I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, Jerome, and I will stop sharing my screen so that hopefully he's able to do exactly that. You're still on mute, uh, Jerome. Is that better by any chance? Yeah, it's, uh, it's okay. All right, I've been Thanks. muting and unmuting, but it was a bit bizarre anyway. Right, so sorry for this, this uh, interlude. Um, 
So I, I suspect that uh, many of you uh, have allocated to, to infrastructure equity. Many of you uh, have allocated to direct lending or, or private debt. But I'm pretty sure that not so many of you have allocated to infrastructure debt. That m may be a little bit bizarre, but that that what I've I've seen over over the past few years, and, and the, the answer has been consistently that uh, infrastructure debt does not yield enough. So what I'll be trying today is to convince you or explain you how to look at infrastructure debt in a different way and potentially consider it as a relevant asset classes to, to invest in across the cycle and the title of this presentation and no whatever solution. So first and foremost, um, just again, last technical problem. I just can't move the, the slide deck. Bear with me for a sec. Um, here we go. So what is, well, what is infrastructure debt? Obviously, it's all about infrastructure and uh, financing the real, the real economy. So on that note, you are all familiar with infrastructure, uh, what is behind infrastructure and how th that plays out. Um, what I would like you to, to do or look at is to forget what you know about it, debt or infrastructure debt and see it from another perspective. Namely, see it not as a, a, a debt product as opposed to equity, but probably as something who is different um, and has a, a risk return profile. So here we go. Um, slides I've just come back. And if you look across the capital structure, then there is a risk return continuum. So one must not think as infrastructure debt as opposed to equity, for example, but rather as a risk return continuum where um, a, a risk budget will give you a, a certain return. So typically, uh, senior debt would give you a two to three percent return non-investment grade debt would lead to a five percent return on the top of the cap stack equity will will, will give you something around 10 to 12 percent which is five six percent yield plus capital gain there is a big distinction to be made there because TEPT will provide you with cash yield and cash yield and cash yield. Whereas around half of the performance for equity will be delivered in terms of capital gain. So that means that if everything go well, on the equity side, you'll get five plus five equals 10% return. If things go so-so, you will get 5% plus 0% as a capital gain. If things go wrong, you'll get 5% yield and minus 5% capital loss, so you'll get zero. So I think the big difference is debt will bring you income commensurate with the risks, whereas equity will give you a promise of income and a promise of capital gain. So this sets two different purposes. And one needs to look at the global picture and the asset liability picture. If one has to deliver income to, to policyholders, for example, um, and only income, then probably debt is a little bit more relevant than, than equity, because equity will deliver a better return, but will deliver a, a lower cash yield or a negative capital gain or a capital loss. So it's all about striking the right balance between 
um, asset and liabilities and therefore uh, debt can seen can be seen as an integral building block of, of an asset liability matching strategy especially on the income couponing side so this slide has been about directive merits of infrastructure debt and infrastructure equity across the capital structure. We will see later on um, the respective merits of infrastructure debt versus corporate or more traditional private debt and how to counteract or, or, or counter argue versus the, the general claim that junior or infrastructure debt does not yield enough but before that um would like maybe to put things into perspective a and to put things into perspective i'll start wish to start with with, with a number a very intriguing number 2.875 um so the, this number has, has, has a double meaning it's not the square root of something or it's not uh, the, a magic number or whatever it is essentially what sovereign risk-free rates would give you 10 years ago and it's at the same time what one could get when investing into high yield bonds in today's market so in essence 10 years ago risk-free rate 2.875 today 2.875 means double b so maybe infrastructure debt was not relevant 10 years ago but since we are in a zero rate environment and risk free rates being even negative in some countries well infrastructure debt might be a quite an interesting medicine for some investors and that is what we are going to see in the next slide that well that is a bit technical but i need to go into the details because th there may well be some some skewed views um, if if we keep on the surface of things first and foremost what this number of statistical data point shows you is that not all triple b's or not all double b's are born equal in statistical terms that means that the probability of default and the recovery rates so in essence the actual loss of triple b infrastructure debt is closer to single a corporate than it is closer to triple b corporates so the short message is from um, from an expected loss perspective triple b infra debt behaves more or less like single a corporate debt in the same vein double b infra debt behaves more or less like triple b corporate debt so when one um, benchmark infra debt one should think of this twist of this trick that one has to contrast infra debt with offering that have a similar risk budget namely a similar expected loss so if one contrasts infra debt investment grade infra debt with single a that may well um, see or show infra debt as an attractive alternative so single a public bonds probably 50 75 ish versus 200 basis point over for infra debt so quite attractive similarly non-investment grade infrastructure debt will give you five percent for a risk budget that is equivalent to triple b corporate debt and we all know that expected loss increase with rating in an exponential way so you'll get a return that may be a little bit lower than private debt it's not six seven eight it's five but the risk budget you have is much 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 lower so in essence from a pure risk adjusted return perspective infrastructure debt is quite attractive 
when compared to publicly listed bonds or to direct lending. And these numbers, as you can see from the small prints on the slides, are not Schroeder's numbers. They are from a reputable rating agencies, <coughs> these, not, not, not to name them. And they have been used over a very long period from 80, 1983 to 2015, so over more than 30 years. It's quite a long period. So these are, I uh, would say, reliable number. So in a sense, infradet may look a little bit cheap, but if you look at it from a risk return adjusted perspective, it's quite interesting. I've been discussing risk return. For some of you, uh, regulatory capital might be on the agenda, especially Solvency 2. The good news for you is that there is a specific Solvency 2 treatment for infradet. So in a nutshell, uh, there is a favorable regime and infradet as a regulatory capital charge that is 30%, one third lower than traditional corporate debt. So if one looks at regulatory capital as well, infradet is a very interesting tool from a regulatory arbitrage perspective. So risk adjusted return, risk adjusted return is interesting, point number one. Regulatory capital might also be an interesting component to look at. We are in 2021, so I cannot avoid the theme of ESG and sustainability and impact. I'll not be too long on that front because it's, it's quite obvious for everybody that infrastructure is an obvious candidate for ESG oriented strategies, just to name renewables, for example. That's infrastructure, that's energy transition, that's about investing in, in, in new and greener infrastructure. So the icing of the cake is that by investing into infrastructure debt, you'll get de facto an ESG or green angle to your investments. So, so just to summarize, why is infrastructure debt interesting? Because it will provide you income yield with low volatility and low risk, because obviously it provides duration, because it can bring you efficient regulatory capital treatment, and last but not least, because infrastructure is all about ESG. So that's the end of the presentation, and hopefully by now you've been convinced that infrastructure debt is a little bit less irrelevant in your allocation than that you may have thought 15, 20 minutes ago. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Sharon, for your presentation. Um, and I think now it's the time that we uh, move on to the Q&A session. I've uh, seen a couple of questions coming by. That should be now in the chat box. If you have any uh, additional questions, please uh, direct them to the chat box and Anna-Marie will take care of them. Um, I'm now looking at Anna-Marie uh, because you probably uh, have seen the, uh, the questions coming in, in the chat box. So can you kick off? You are still on mute. Hi. That's better. Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, thanks for, for all the presentations. Um, a couple of, well, lots of questions coming in, um, and particularly so far on, on uh, for a question on Pascal and, the, and his research. Um, let me let me kick off with, uh, yeah, a question on the, on the risk measure. Is it purely sample based from history or something more complex? How did you calculate this, uh, Pascal? Is that a question to me or to Pascal? Uh, to, sorry, to Pascal, yes. This is uh, using historical quarterly returns. So, so it is not a very complex uh, calculation. The modified value at risk is just taking into account uh, the skewness of, of the returns. That's one um, of the methods we typically would use. And then the uh, shortfall risk calculation 
is just using historical uh, returns, uh, calling them expected quarterly returns, minus the target level divided by, by the variation of standard deviation, and then transformed by the Z value into a probability. So it's not rocket science, it's, it's very simply uh, calculated, but it gives you a feeling for what, what the risk of the portfolio um, looks like. Um, could you elaborate on what you think drives the historical outperformers and what will be a sustainable source looking forward? Yes, so so I saw this question. This this has several levels to, to consider. One is uh, what also my my co-speakers have said. There is a there is a regulatory change in the market. That's only one source of sustainable returns. Uh, for example, there is research out that proves in a difference of difference approach that banks have really gone down in loan to value based lending. So also they they do not like to 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 base lending on existing or future projected cash flows. They like collateralized lending rather than uh, cash flow based lending, which which is a change of the game, basically in the market. So in in the past, typical. Uh, lenders, if it, if it is syndicated loans or merchant banks, they will be using, they would be using in the past, cash flow based projections and then lend against those uh, projected cash flows. This, this is something that we see less in the market. So today we see collateralized lending and also in parallel, the loan to values have gone down, at least uh, on the banking side. So the, the nature of the lending is changing on the one side, but also the LTVs uh, are going down on the banking side. And that provides opportunities to, to private lenders. On the other side, I would say from a helicopter view, there are two sources of sustainable uh, good returns, if you want to say good versus bad, which is uh, complexity. Natalie has mentioned that, uh, uh, that term. I, I very much agree that uh, private structuring can can lead to transactions that are faster, uh, that, that can cope with more complexity in a transaction. So if you need to be fast and, and able to structure more complex transactions, uh, then clearly the source of that is highly qualified teams. So I wouldn't think that private borrowing or private lending is typically a mass product. I think the market is somehow limited, so it's not the right form of, of lending for everybody. But once a transaction is more complex than the standard, and once it needs to be maybe executed in a speed that doesn't really fit a syndicated loan agreement, for example, and if you have a really good team who's able to do both fast and complex transactions, and that is a source of, of superior performance. But also, as, as I said, as our paper also finds out, uh, market timing is, is really important. So for example, these, these funds uh, are allowed to recycle their capital so they can sell and, and reinvest again throughout the investment period. So they will be um, structuring transactions, signing uh, transactions, and then if the market conditions change over the, the, the first, let's say, two to three years, some of those borrowers will want to get out and refinance their debt tranche by a new facility. And that typically triggers minimum return clauses in the contracts that typically triggers penalty fees, et cetera, et cetera. So there are additional fees in the starting phase of a fund, which also makes uh, the return uh, more attractive in that sense. So the recycling of capital in the early phase of a fund uh, improves uh, the return. They might uh, collect origination fees twice or even three times. So that's uh, very important. And also they might be selling portions of their debt in the secondary market, which is a typical way to profit from changes in market conditions, which is also observed in the private debt space. And that enhances largely um, the return of those private debt fund vehicles. So I would say quality of the team, allowing them to be fast uh, and structuring complex transactions, but also the very mechanic of a private debt fund, which is which is uh, cashing in minimum returns, cashing in minimal multiples, 
penalty fees, recycle the capital into a second uh, phase of, of investing in the early stage of a fund and selling portions in the secondary market will make those funds on a sustainable basis more successful. Maybe I can add, add a question to that, uh, maybe for uh, Natalie, because all, all three of you are talking about uh, well the role of the banks, basically the banks that are retreating from the market in, in a way, which is apparently uh, a driver of the private debt market. Uh, but I'm curious to hear from you whether there is more than that, because you see also a strong increase in activity in the private equity market, uh, which you cannot attribute to the to the fact that uh, well banks are less active. Uh, so there's more than just the role of the banks, I would say. So what are the other major drivers of the growth in the private debt market? Maybe for you, Natalie? For you, Natalie? Uh, so, so I think there are a couple of things. I think clearly the opportunity created by the retrenchment uh, of the banks is, is one factor. But I would say the second factor is the investor universe, be they pension funds or insurance companies, are on the hunt for some level of yield. And depending on their risk tolerance, they are looking for alternative ways of, of obtaining that return. Um, and, and so I think that when you move and you look at private debt, uh, you don't necessarily, for insurance companies, for instance, want to increase the risk level. Um, so therefore, you're perhaps looking towards investment grade infrastructure, social housing, uh, investment grade real estate debt. So I think you've got the pushing from the investor side for looking for more product and a broader range to fit their portfolio at the same time as the market opportunity that has been created by the banks pulling back across the piece. It's not just in real estate debt, it's across the whole credit spectrum. Okay, thank you. Maybe back to you, uh, Anna Marie. And, uh, Jer Jerome talked, of, of course, about the ESG in the infra debt. Uh, there was also a question, how is ESG integration in the private debt, uh, Pascal? Yes, thank you for the question. I'm happy to, to answer. Um, we have just now finished uh, a draft of a paper with, with, uh, in a team. So we looked at ESG integration in, in the private markets, uh, including uh, not only private debt, but also private equity, venture capital, buyout funds, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a global database, a worldwide database addressing exactly that topic. Um, we are looking at, at uh, transparency in terms of ESG. We are looking at the risk, at the relationship between uh, ESG risk and ESG transparency. But we're also looking at other factors such as being a signatory to some standards like the United Nations uh, principles for responsible investments, etc. Um, and we look at investor categories, how they influence uh, the ESG transparency and different asset classes. This study will be published, I hope, by the end of the year. Um, the outcomes are, are uh, kind of very interesting. So we, we overall observed that um, ESG transparency is lower than in the public markets. That is not a big surprise, uh, given the pressures in the public markets. But there is a clear link between risk and transparency. So, so we would not say that we observe greenwashing in the market. This is one of the big question marks, right? So do private market participants greenwash ESG? So we don't exactly uh, observe that. So there is a clear relation between risk and transparency. But what we also see is that there are other categories other than risk that do drive transparency of those funds. And, and, and these are like those uh, uh, signatory um, dimensions. Um, and, and I don't want to, to give the results as of yet, uh, because that's an interesting topic. Is it, uh, does it create value in, in terms of an ESG um, quality measure or ESG transparency to be signatory to UNPRI, yes or no? Are the differences between the US and Europe? I can say yes, uh, there are big differences. How do investors affect ESG transparency? Does it make a difference if a fund has an investor base that is more institutional uh, driven than private investor driven, etc. And how do these asset classes differ in terms of uh, in terms of ESG? 
I'm happy to send that out once the paper is uh, in the market, but we're still working on the data, especially in interpreting uh, the data. What I can say is that label adopters, so we call um, in a more politically correct way, you could, you, know, you could call them greenwashers, but let's say label adopters underperform the market. So those who do as if they were ESG compliant but are not really ESG compliant, depends on the definition, how you find that out, they do underperform the market. And this may have several reasons. Um, so the ESG paper, I think, is going to be out in the market in December. And I'm happy to share with, with your association and the members the results and discuss those results if this is uh, important for your members, which I hope and believe, of course. Also, I wanted to add to Natalie's uh, comment on what's a driver of this uh, market. Uh, we should not forget flexibility of those instruments, right? So anybody who has tried to restructure a public bond with retail investors will know that this is almost important. Uh, impossible to do. So restructure a public debt instrument in view of any corporate changes or any any, any maybe market-driven uh, changes. Uh, there is no flexibility whatsoever unless you have a call option on the bond. But if you have um, if you have longer-term bonds in the market, and I think today's markets really also aim for more flexibility, even though if banks still are in, in the uh, syndicated loan market aggressively advertising their capital, I think private debt just offers more flexibility to borrowers and they are willing, it seems, to pay something for that flexibility. I cannot prove that empirically, that's just the gut feeling. Uh, would be an interesting study. question for Pascal. Maybe uh, then we go over to Natalie and Jerome again. But uh, there's some questions on the, on the correlation of returns between uh, private debt and private equity. Um, hey, what, Pascal, what's your view on the, the correlation between returns between those two categories? And do you think it could be, let's say, a potential hidden risk for investors if they want to invest in both uh, asset categories? Um, yes, that's, that's a very valid and, and important question. Um, which again shows you the, the necessity for more research uh, in the sector. So we do know that uh, private debt is largely also driven by private equity. So these large capital providers such as uh, KKR, Apollo, uh, the Blackstones, etc., of this world, they do have both. They typically have private equity and private debt that, uh, activities and, and they know each other have given you the number in terms of market concentration. So these guys, the good guys, all know each other. Um, and it might well be that if one makes a completely wrong assumption about one industry development, for example, or companies in that industry, that then you have a risk concentration on this wrong assumption. That That is, that is easily possible. There is no research done on that, so I cannot really comment that, but I would say Approximately 50 to 60 percent of the private debt market is driven by private equity sponsors. And given that these markets are so much concentrated, I would also uh, um, give this some weight when you construct a portfolio uh, to really take care of these concentration risk topics. Maybe I can ask a question, uh, Anna Marie. Uh... For Jerome, uh, so I was triggered by one of his comments uh, with regard to uh, infra debt, uh, which could be a good alternative for, let's say, uh, well, uh, single A corporate. If I'm um, if I'm correct, which would also mean that uh, infra debt could possibly fit well within a matching portfolio where you try to match your liabilities. Uh, two questions on that. Uh, when you look at investors in practice, uh, is that also the way they use infra debt in their portfolio? So for matching the liabilities. And does it also mean that that correlates well with, in this case, uh, for example, swap rates? Maybe better than uh, corporate of, or government single A uh, paper? I think it, it does to, to a certain extent. Um, I think what you 
well, the common features of, of infradet and, and listed bonds is low risk and, and duration. It's it, it one of the few areas in the private debt market when one can get a 10, 15 years paper with a full prepayment protection spend clause. So that's pretty much a duration tool. That that's the two common common features. The, the two differences which are intertwined is that infradet gives a, a higher return. This is due to several things. This is due to the complexity premium, but this is as well due to the fact. Let's face it that central banks can buy public bonds. They can buy like private debt. So the the quantitative easing a massive program uh, have taken their toll on, on public yields. So it does indeed yield more, but, and that's a big but, like any other private debt, infrastructure debt is illiquid. And you know that investors by, or by regulation have a certain, or have to comply with certain liquidity buffers. So one cannot substitute all of its govies or, or bonds with infrared. Well, two reasons. First of all, the universe is not big enough to, to, to fill the gap, point number one. And point number two, any and all investor will have a limit on illiquid debt. Uh, it's like if it's 2%, 3%, 5%, but there is a limit to it. So today, infrared is like the icing on the cake something one may use as a quid pro quo for, for corporate bonds to spice the return a little bit up in exchange of, of liquidity. But since it's illiquid and will remain so, but by nature, it just can't be a big chunk of, of a, let's say, a, um, a bond allocation for big investors. It will remain a small uh, option, but an interesting one. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm also looking at the clock uh, since we are uh, almost uh, at five. I'm checking with Anne Marie. Uh, are there any questions still left in the chat box? Maybe one more to, to Natalie from uh, Jan Bertes um, about the exploding real estate prices. Uh, aren't we looking at higher instead of lower risk for the coming years in real estate debt? So, so I think that what we've seen, and, and we've just recently published um, our updated house view on uh, real estate performance, um, which is a story of differing sectors. I think you've got some sectors that are very clear winners, and the weight of money into real estate equity is, is helpful in this, and then you've got other sectors that are clearly the, the losers. I think that the the art of real estate debt is that we are only focused on the downside because that's what you get. You don't get any upside. So structuring the debt is all about structuring to a valuation that you have already stressed so that it is a value through the cycles. And this is the way that the rating agencies also rate um, real estate debt transactions. So when the market uh, is particularly down, we might lend 60, 65% of a property yielding 8%. Um, when the market is as uh, prices are as high as they are at the moment, we are more likely to be at 45 to 50% because we've already stressed that yield back up, say from four you know, to, to 6%. So real estate debt, like other debt products, is all about focusing the amount of risk that you're prepared to take given where you are in, in the market. Um, having said that, the overall outlook for real estate uh, is quite positive with uh, good areas of rental growth supporting and underpinning uh, values where they are at the moment uh, when you think that the risk-free rate is, is pretty well a zero. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie. Well, given time, I think uh, we need to uh, to stop here, um, but not before I have uh, thanked my uh, 
my speakers for today. So uh, great, thank you to uh, Pascal, Jerome, and Natalie. Thank you very much for uh, sharing your views uh, with us. I also uh, want to thank all the participants in this webinar for being here and uh, for all your questions. Uh, again, uh, the presentations and the link to the webinar will be sent out tomorrow. Uh, anything else I have to, to tell, Anne-Marie? Am I forgetting something? Oh, and I think uh, we will we'll, um, yeah, send around also the uh, the new research materials from oh, yeah. Pascal when they're get, getting out. So that will be interesting as well to watch. Absolutely. All right. With that, uh, again, I want to thank everyone and I uh, wish you a pleasant night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.